Hi everyone, this is um, a second last lecture for the semester or tutorial, however you wish to call it. And what I wanted to do today with our online students is to have a more of a discussion rather than a yet another lecture. Nonetheless, we need a little bit of lecture so that you can come to terms with the resources in the modules, especially module four. So I have said it a few times that our modules are like a library for you to draw on. It's not like a uh, transmission model of, lang of, of, liter of, of learning how to teach literacy, whereby if you cover those readings, you will pop out as a genius, right? This is not what I want to model in this class because it goes against everything that university stand and stand for and also what modern education stands for sometimes to us it seems this makes life easier until someone asks us a question that we can't answer because our reflective skills and the capacity to link things together was not modeled and required from us. So at the same time, it is very difficult to pre-prepare modules in such a linear way. So we need these lectures that I post on the announcements page that help us to summarize and condense everything and ident identify the things that matter for the assignment. So this little YouTube lecture is designed to help us with assignment two to summarize particular things, but not to cover everything. But what I would like to do today is to focus on the role of the reading for emotion strategy that enables students to read better. It's a new strategy and I will produce arguments, some arguments why it is, in my view, a better way to look at texts. I am not saying that it should be used while disregarding other approaches that you might be learning in other units with different lecturers but I will talk about advantages shortly. So what has happened so far? This is important to say what we've done so far and how far we have gone so that you can actually feel a little bit cheered up that all these weeks actually amounted to something. So we've learned that literacy, and this includes reading because we read to have literacy skills, um, not read in order to decipher a text, but have no idea of the context that informed it and also how we, how we could relate to it. So we learned that literacy is a complex term. It has a personal dimension. It has a social dimension. What else does it have? It has um, the cultural dimension, value, value or ethical dimension. It has also a cognitive dimension, right? So all these processes, uh, literacy teaching has to integrate. Otherwise, we're not teaching the curriculum. We're teaching our own version of what we believe the curriculum should include. Now, we're not in that position. We have a contract with the taxpayers and we have no choice <clears throat> but 
teach to the curriculum. I am fully aware that there, you will find voices that criticize the curriculum. Everybody wants to criticize. We're sort of like that. This is a positive aspect of human behavior. But to criticize informed, it's another story, right? And so um, this is what I wanted to say. Now, coming now to the things that matter for assignment two, it is important, therefore, that when we plan our teaching, we actually integrate all these aspects, which is the, the idea that we teach for um, those general capabilities or, read, or being, belonging and becoming. These are the sort of the main uh, co uh, competencies and skills that we want to achieve while focusing on the content and in the context of activities that take account of the cross-curriculum priorities, right? So in this way, we can actually um, account for the entire three dimensions of the curriculum in our planning. So I would like you to plan. I pulled out uh, in previous classes we had together, I pulled out a, a planning um, uh, table created by one of our ex students. I'm not saying it is any good. I, it's just an example. And an example of how I don't want to say it because what you can say is the student here have this language literacy literature, which is fantastic. Maybe the student also had a discussion about the capabilities on another slide. I can't recall. But what's happening here, the student copied and pasted the content related outcomes right and what we learned in our unit that now you need to contextualize those content related outcomes what exactly what kind like if we look at the first one understand the patterns of language right like what patterns in relation to what literature the person is not saying here what lit, what specific literature um, literature the they will be used, pardon me, they will be used, I can't select here because it's a photo, what specific literature they will be using, what specific literacy skills, they will be using specific, not show how ideas point. You need to contextualize it and I will show you how I did that and you already have seen it, but I will come back to it. So I want contextualization, which are in specific to what you will be doing, not just copying and pasting outcomes. I could do it. Right? Anyone can do that, but now contextualizing them in relation to your plan is a challenge. It's difficult, but someone else who sees your plan, they will go, oh my God, right? And then they will be able to teach your design, and then you can become a leader, teacher, and so on, because you will have people under you or who will be... Uh, able to be guided by you because you produce these um, rich plannings as opposed to uh, copy paste copy paste and nobody knows what it means okay so if I look at this understand the part that patterns of language interactions do particular things I'm as a teacher who's gonna teach this plan I wonder what the heck does that mean what am I gonna do right so if you want to make me feel confident that you can do planning for reading, I need to see the detail. So let me just remind you what we did last week so that... So last week we did two things, right? The first thing, we came up with this notion, if I can find it somewhere. Anyway, we came up with this notion of exploratory phase of lesson design and then a focused stage of lessons design. I'll just try to find it. Right, so if you want to have a look what these things meant, um, we've discussed them in detail last week during our collaborate session, which is recorded. So um, I didn't use those terms here but I've discussed in early childhood uh, how to do it, then I use them here in primary and I use them here in 
all the senior years, but middle school and beyond. So I have just now added the master in focus and explore and play stages just for early childhood people. So explore and play, you will watch it and there are particular strategies that you can use. Oh, here they are, explore and master. I didn't have to do that. So, um, right, so explore and play is extremely important, but you still need focused activities. So I discussed them and they're here and there are resources for doing these things. So your drills, your focused, explicit activities might actually belong to master and or should belong to master and focus stages of class. Master and focus stage of class must not be ever the entire class. Kids are small and the memories of children will not cope with it. Their heads will explode out. They will basically lose their focus. So that's last week. And the week before, I think, then we talked about the characteristics of a learning environment, high interactivity. You can only have high interactivity if actually you also create an information rich environment. It's, it's hardly with tools and resources, tools for analysis, strategies for analysis, opportunities for analysis, compare, contrast, evaluate. But you can't compare, contrast, evaluate until you actually have some richness there. So high interactivity, richness in resources and opportunities to do these exploratory, exploratory play activities and also activities which are uh, form focused. Um, we also need and another characteristic is the diversity in terms of cultures and perspectives. So um, we've discussed that. So now all these things, the master and the exploratory and play and these features of a learning environment has to now be present in your planning for your planning to reflect um, um, a form of um, integration of everything we have learned that, the, that would align with the requirements of the curricula that are relevant to your context. So uh, our lecture plan, our tutorial plan is actually reflected in our announcements. So you've got the teaching line, the storyline of our teachings here. And in week eight, or what I thought was week eight, might have been week seven, um, you have here a template document. And this is where I uh, was indicating the elements that need to be present in your detailed descriptions of your lessons as you plan them. So if you click on it, you'll get somewhere or you get something. And today what I will show you is how I suggest we could think of completing the last column, which is what the, 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 um, the course of the lesson, of the content of the lesson. So I'm a little bit nervous doing this because I don't want to lose the plot here. Planning is a complex thing. But as you can see, I've identified a few reading support strategies. Support, reading, helping children. How will strategies to help children in the context of their reading, to help them read? So there are different strategies that I actually like and I have identified. Now, for lesson one, two, three, and four, I'm not using those, so I cross them out. But I did add, right, so you don't have to cross them out, you just don't include them, but I need them specified. Because we're teaching readings, I want to know what strategies will you be um, using. Now, obviously, um, the best would be also to reference them. So you can reference to this to this collaborate if you if you just can't think of anything else. I obviously being a little bit older, or at least older in education in literacy, I would say Bruno Latour, who is like number one, um, and here um, Panksepp. I can't remember how to spell them, and 
things that I had this all this lockdown is creating sort of your brain turning into a noodle. So reading for emotion is Anya Lyon. Remember Panksep, that guy who did the um, neuroscience of emotion? I got it from him. Reading for emotions, Anya Lyon, based on multitude research in but uh, in uh, neuroscience, but specifically, actually, Antonio D uh, Damasio and this girl, what's her name? She works with him. She finished PhD in Harvard. Um, I can't remember. Imordino Young. Imordino Young, right? So. None of that comes out from my empty head. It's actually building on other people. Analyze, identify features. We could put Bloom here. I'm very happy. Everybody knows that we need to analyze and we need to evaluate, right? You can put Bloom here. You can put Anya Lyons tutorial or you can put here even Punksep. Um, I would put someone else here. Actually, I myself, in my own work, uh, I would put Jordan Peterson because he really nicely points to research that I don't know. Um, it's from Russia, uh, but it's a very nice research that basically says we always act by evaluating what's important, right? So you're not seeing the whole world at once, you're seeing now the computer. There could be mouse running behind you and having a good time. And not until you say it or have a reason to turn around like there is a noise, you will not say it's going to eat all your cheese. So, so anyway, it'd be nice if you actually included references where you got those strategies from. Um, so I'm not using those. So I crossed them out here, but they exist. So aesthetics I use based on Ramachandran. So it's an alliance based on Ramachandran. Speech, uh, text to speech and, and, and speech to text. That's basically my own invention. So it's Lion and if you use them. That's Lion and Norman, 2017. See how nicely it is to actually know the references. Um, it, Punk Seppets, I can't remember what's his book. I think 1999. But you can, you can, uh, it's a neuroscience of emotions. It's on the internet. You can find it anywhere. Um, so, and the phonic drills, it's just like everyone else in, in literacy, right? Because everybody does phonic drills. So, but I've given you some paper last week uh, that talks about and some other resources on phonic drills. So you've got stuff there. So it'd be nice to reference so you look educated, right? Because that's the idea. We always reference to say that we've read and we're smart. Then you have all these three things and I try to contextualize them. Um, you probably will do it better than me, but I just did it to show you that that's, that, you know, interacting I mean, pardon me, that contextualizing is possible. So I'd identify um, the resource that I will use. I will use mainly one resource for this class. That's a surprise because normally I tell people to use more, but I do use a couple here or one more in addition um, so that I can achieve the exploratory aspect right so exploratory compare contrast explore right seeking the seeking uh circuit right so punkstep talks about the seeking circuit we were talking about that so i need to somehow enable that so, so um i do so um yeah so we've got all of those now we'll get them we've got them out of the way so i can push them now here and then i was thinking okay so how can I introduce to you that in, in, in a greater detail, but maybe a little bit more uh, up to date, the concept of reading for emotion and why it is important? Well, it is important from a number of things. Well, first of all, emotion is important. You know that awareness of your emotions is extremely important for social and personal capabilities. Uh, so you self-manage, right? You know when to open your mouth and you know when not to. You know how to evaluate what you, your intentions in terms of emotions, because if I say to the vice chancellor, hi, old mate, right? He's not going to be happy and it may not turn out very happy for me too. So uh, every intention, we, you've learned it from other people, from other lecturers that you study, but every time we do something, it is motivated by N intentions. Human beings are... Um, intention driven purpose driven we always have purpose right so when i want to do anything that's because 
I have an urge for it or I have a reason for it. There's something driving it. So we're not always logical. That's why I said urge, because sometimes we are driven by these um, brain circuits that Punksip talks about. But it's always purposeful. And being increasingly aware of it, it's your job as a teacher to actually make students increasingly aware. So the idea of the reading for emotion model came up from my research on building students' resilience, primary children resilience, but it relates to anyone. I've learned a lot myself from it, and actually I use it. So before I open my mouth, I'll be, uh, very often when I write emails, because email you can sort of unsend, um, I ask myself, what emotion is motivate uh, is underneath the intention I want to effect, right? What emotion do I want to communicate? So it's not like I want to say hello to someone, but the way you say hello is motivated by a particular emotion you want to communicate. I'll get that guy. You know, I hate this guy. So instead of saying, hi, friend, you will say something else maybe i can't think of things because i'm a nice person in, in general so i can't think how could you say hello to someone or how you could uh, write because you have to say hello but not in a nice way so um yes we have these options right so it's extremely important that we're aware of the emotions that are underneath our intentions right and so intentions we all act on our intentions and each of our intention is motivated by a particular emotion. So the way we actually realize or manifest our intentions depends on the emotion we want to communicate. So if you love someone, you say, hi, sweetie, right? If you don't love someone, you will not say, hi, sweetie. It's still, still a hello. Now, um, one of the things I might say, I want to make this reading for emotional accessible for you. I want you to actually be aware of it. I want you to play with it in the assignment and also maybe one day in your career as teacher. Um, there is obviously the right and wrong way of playing with it, but when you play with it, you will maybe develop your own right and wrong ways of working with it. And there's nothing wrong with it because, you know, it's, it's a model that you then send into the world like your child. You never know what will happen. <laughs> you try your best, but then, you know, they, they're on their own. So there are two things about the model I wanted to say. It's the first one, maybe three things. So the first one is we always communicate emotions. So those intentions are always communicated uh, with an emotion that we want people to actually detect, right? So being aware of the emotions that we're communicating is a good thing. Now, very often I get my uh, some of my uh, ELA 200 students that in, so they stop learning here, right? This is it. They switch off the computer and just go home and do the planning. Now, the problem is that a text is a series of emotions. So you first make people, you intrigue a person. Then you make them appalled or angry. Then you make them, you know, you, you, you play with people's emotions and the, uh, as you write the text in order to convince them to your message. Look at this. First I intrigued you. Then I made you angry. Then I made you, you know, see how convinced to my point of view, you know, the clarity that I wanted you to see through my sort of whatever. So by the time, I, right, so basically what I want to say, the text is never just one emotion. There are shifts. Right, first this, then that. So the text has moves. And there's a lot of linguists out there in the world who came up with 300 different models of those moves. Now, as a teacher, I don't think it's very useful. For a linguist, it may be. I, um, I am a linguist that uses linguistic skills, not linguistic knowledge. I change knowledge. I use pedagogy to change knowledge about the text. So I am a linguist that it's what you know by, by job i'm an applied linguist i'm using linguistics or my linguistic skills to create more models of linguistics that actually help you as a teacher in classrooms so i would like to run away from these 300 different models of looking at the text because you can't even hold one in your head let alone more than five and, and they have a number of them and some of them are actually not very detailed. So there's a lot of gaps, you know, in the beginning, they know what to say, orientation, complication, but there, there is three quarter of a page whereby they leave it empty. And then they say, oh, here's a conclusion, 
right? It's just not enough. Maybe it's good for linguists. It's not enough for a teacher. So there are so so to remember, we communicate emotions. No text is just one emotion. So we cannot say that this uh, fable made me laugh. Maybe maybe at the end made you laugh, but it took you through stages. So you need to be aware that a text is a series of emotions through which a, a, a story takes you, so that you can uh, experience it. So it's very important to know those stages. I have invented my own stages. Now, I didn't invent all of them by myself. Where can I show you the best? Oh, no. So, I developed them from my own work, but some of them you basically can already um, can already relate to, I've seen them before. So instead of orientation, I don't like orientation, I just don't think it has a meaning to anybody, it's the focus, right? So first you have a story of the focus. So where are we? Where are we? What are we talking about, right? That's the most, and in English, the, the main thing is of the story is always in the beginning. So you want to connect the reader to the story, right? You want to create a connection of sorts. So that's the feeling, right? You want to create a, a positive re um, connection, maybe negative connection, maybe, you know, I don't know. But basically the focus is about the first stage. So there will be a separate emotion for focus. There will be a separate emotion for what they call complication. Complication is not a correct word in my view. Uh, disturbance is better because things go well and then the contrast happens, right? Contrast, not complication, contrast. So here we have, just to be, you know, since we have this file open, we might look. So grasshopper is happy, you know, hopping, chirping, having a great time. And then this <laughs> change happens. And then it comes by toiling an ear of corn is a contrast. So disturbance is a contrast. Happy scene, different scene altogether, right? So some of you who were more conscientious and managed to open in module two or in module four, this long file when I analyzed, using this model, I analyzed a number of texts from linguists to show that my model is actually more explanatory and does more. With, 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 uh, with the stories by Aboriginal people um, when they were you know, uh, taken from their families and taken to white people or to convents and so on, what we have here, very often the story starts, it was a great day, we were together, we were chirping and, and hopping, right? We, we were a family together and then all of a sudden we heard the police siren and a hard knock at the door. It is, it is not a complication. You know, to call it a complication, it's a kind of understatement. So you have to find a word that can be universally used for texts, right? And disturbance is actually, you know, this contrast. It was all good, then there was this hard knock at the door. Like if, if you sit at home, you know, at 7 p.m., everybody's singing songs, and someone bangs your door, you, your heart is beating faster, right? Um, so there, so there's this different emotion will be here, right? So then the next move in the text is the dialogue. It's all, there's always a dialogue. Um, even when the dialogue is not present in, in an explicit way as in here, the text always has a dialogue. But this is like postgraduate level of this model and or at least another four weeks. We don't have the time. So this is just for you to learn that there's a thing like that. So there's a dialogue. So, you know, the bang at the door and the police talks to the family. You've done this and this, or we came here to do the, this and this, right? So uh, now people are what? Trying to calibrate themselves. They feel confused, and there's a confusion. So confusion is a different feeling than a, conf a feeling of anxiety, right? Scared, scared and anxiety are different things. Or terrified and anxiety is a different thing. Anxiety is uh, it's yet, in those uh, Aboriginal stories, it's still um, a not uh, well-focused emotion, right? We don't re really know whether things will go well or not, but the dialogue is actually telling you it's going to be bad, right? So in here, in, in a grasshopper story, what we have all is going well. Life couldn't be better. Now we have this new role model, right? An end. It's a contrast, different emotion, right? Um, now, 
so um, so there I will not talk about what emotion this is a, we will get to that when I discuss the planning so we have a contrast the ant is not hopping and chirping right it's doing something else so what's happening here we have some sort of you know trying to find this through the dialogue you know the two are trying to clarify their positions right so it's a different mood now right here is just a like a contrast it's a surprise um and here we have two positions that are being actually explicated to us and the development how do we know it's the development because now we see how the story went on from now right so all this happened so what did actually happen well but the end went on but is it here what the linguists call a connector i don't teach connectors i teach emotion so what emotion is here? Um, you know, the end did her own thing. How do you know that the end did her own thing? The end went away. But how do you know it did its own thing? That but says, in spite of what, we could have said here, in spite of what the grasshopper said, the end ignored it and went on its way. So but is not the only connector you could have here. You could have had here, in spite of what Grasshopper was saying, the end did it did her own or its own thing, right? You so you could discuss with children. What else could we have say have here? So um, these discussions are very important for learning. If we talk about meaningful learning, as opposed to uh, imprinting on children's head that every time you want to have an opposition, you say but. Well, not every time. Most of the time you don't write but, right? There's a place for but, but there's not always a place for but. There are other genres in which but wouldn't be actually the most happy word. So the story went on. And what happened? Life happened, right? So it's a resolution we have here. So resolution is not the moral. Resolution happened is, resolution is, so is the finding of the whole you know, it, it tells you, it, it, it kind of, it, it's, it's, it's the answer to the question, right? So the answer, the question was uh, uh, this contrast here, and now we have an answer to the question, right? When winter came, now we knew why the ant was working its guts out and why the ant was not necessarily approving the behavior of the uh, grasshopper. And now we have a moral. Now you will see uh, when you work with children in schools and maybe even when you prepare for this assignment and you pick up some stories um, of your own choice, you will find out that some stories may not have um, articulated moral. But the moral is implied, which means you still teach it. But then you may ask children, what's the moral? Right? And we, I think we might have spoken about it. It's the hardest thing for children to articulate. I've worked, I've worked with adults. I was doing professional development in a private English school in Cambodia. And the teachers who were teaching in the private school, they, they found it very hard to come up with the moral. Even though, you know, you may think it's easy, there will be stories that wording things in that sort of neat way and maybe sometimes even detect relationships in the text. It's not an easy thing. And I'm telling you this because uh, if you find it challenging, remember many people do, and also if your children will find it challenging, your students, um, remember, even adults do. So um, a little bit of patience here and understanding because um, as we grow older, sometimes we think things are natural, they're not natural, they're difficult, and they require a lot of learning. So this is the reading for emotion. Now, um, just to add to it, just, just to digress a little bit, this story has a linear sort of uh, structure. First, the first focus happened, then disturbance, then dialogue, then development, blah, blah, blah. Not every narration and story is like that. Now, maybe for children's stories, it will be sufficient. So for primary, for primary, or early primary transition and early childhood, this model works fine. It works for everything else, 
but if you look for a more complex story say for example uh, okay so that's one but i wanted to find the kangaroo first my favorite kangaroo story was my kangaroo story so kangaroo story kangaroo story had a different model and now i don't this is not well um I didn't really in this particular PowerPoint I didn't draw it well but I will explain it so the kangaroo story had a focus right one day you know the kangaroo was quite worried about the little Joey as it was playing around and sort of like you know doing its own thing so kangaroo mother was quite sort of worried about him because he could just run away or do something crazy because kangaroo mother didn't have a uh, pouch yet because that's the story it's an aboriginal story about how the kangaroo got its pouch i got it from uh, youtube so and i would pay someone to show me the whole drawing of this story maybe i'll find it just one second okay so i'll just uh, how many times did it have uh how many times it was repeated three times and I've got that little drawing here, which is only two times, but never mind. So the focus happened, you know, the mother kangaroo was quite, you know, worried about the kangaroo baby. And then disturbance happened. Oh my God, a wallaby came. Oh my God, it's a contrast, right? You know, so mother kangaroo is worried about the baby. And then now what happened? Another problem happened. So as if the mother kangaroo didn't have enough problems, then the new component, new sort of, uh thing to worry about arrived on the scene right and then the mother kangaroo said to the, uh, the one but what what's happening to you blah 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 kangaroo and i'm not very happy uh i want to eat i'm hungry oh so they went on and the mother kangaroo you know i don't know whatever he was thirsty or something so the mother kangaroo took him to a pond the, the wallaby or whatever it was um, there wasn't a wallaby. What was it? What did I say? It was a wombat. The wombat drank the water and you would think now we can go to resolution in the morrow, but we didn't. What happened? The wombat didn't stop whinging. So the wombat then developed another worry. And if you can read those worries here, then good on you. I can't. Uh, you know, so the first thing he... Uh, Oh yeah, he was sick and blind, blah, 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 whatever. So anyway, so the first thing he wanted water, then so he, um, I use the other model because it makes my life easier to compare. So the first, so, so, so anyway, so, so first it was, let's assume it was water. Then the next story, he wanted to go and eat. Then the next, next thing happened, like the one that was never happy, right? But any, in any event, finally the, you know, things develop in such a way. So you can see that every time the development, we go to the development stage of the story where the mother kangaroo just fed or uh, led the wombat to the water, instead to jump to the resolution, we, get, we went to another disturbance, which is another contrast. Now, you know, fed, wombat wanted something else. And then, you know, um, after the wombat drank, well, he wanted something else, right? Wombat in Polish is he, so just now and then when you hear these he's, uh, just forgive me so anyway now and then the you know so as soon as we could have gone for development to resolution of a story but I got another thing but remember resolution is the answer to the question and the question really is that the mother kangaroo found her little joey a bit of a handful right so that's the problem we have here mother kangaroo you know it's a sort of so um so what happened but the mother so the mother no that was the context right but the problem was that the wombat added to her problems and didn't just add once to her problem added again and again to her problems so oh my god and mother kangaroo even though she was worried about her little baby she was still uh obliging to the uh wombat and taking care of the wombat what does this tell you the mother kangaroo was loving right loving not just her own baby but other creatures so the resolution here happens when the mother mother kangaroo goes to sleep and the spirit comes upon the mother kangaroo and gives her or gifts her with a pouch so that now the loving mother kangaroo can um you know reduce her worries and shove the baby into the pouch and then 
if it if, if the mother kangaroo is so helpful then can help other uh, animals but not necessarily also be so anxious about her little baby and the moral of the story is and, and i don't think that there is a ex explicitly sad moral of the story in that story now some people thought that there was i was thinking there isn't you can decide for yourself i think in your resources you have the mother kangaroo story here you have a powerpoint which is called kangaroo you, you, you definitely do so you can make up and i actually typed the whole text so you can make up your mind but if you can see how this story drags and again there was a problem and again there was a problem so what i found here what was interesting that i, f I felt that the moral to me and and this is the creativity of your students uh, sometimes when there is the moral not explicated in a cl clear way, give them the opportunity to come up with their own model. I will pardon me, moral, right? So I gave myself the opportunity to come up with my mo moral. And what for me the moral was that love is patience, patient, right? Love is, love is patient and rewarded. You can say if you do good things, good things happen to you. Right. But... But the fact that the, so that's that's one sort of moral which everybody came up with. I just still like the idea of love being patient because um, because even the, the the structure of a story when it hits three times this disturbance level, it shows to you how patient love is. But even though there is conflict, even though there are problems, you know, we're, we're dealing with it. We don't abandon love. We work with through love. You know, so that's why I like that idea of love in that story, because the story never actually stopped having the disturbance element in it. it went on and on and on. And the mother kangaroo was delivering, delivering. So I find it very interesting that this structure of the story coincided with the idea that love is patient. So there. So my point here was about the reading for emotion model is when we actually identify in the text those switches from chir chirping, happy, um, whether it be kangaroo or unhappy kangaroo, whatever, you know, grasshopper, to the end, to the dialogue, what happens when people want to clarify things, to what happened as a result, and then resolution, you know, to that disturbance, okay? So what happened? Winter came and then grasshopper died. So, um, um, I want you to understand that the text is a series of emotions and we identify those movements from one emotion to the next uh, so that we can actually then maybe draw it or analyze it ourselves how people actually play with our emotions through text play in a maybe positive way but also play in a negative way to manipulate us and that's more or less for older for, for our students in ELA 200 who teach older children whereby you actually want to see how the text actually works on your emotions um, in order to get you to a point. Um, so sometimes rather than looking for the dialogue, looking for perspectives, different co conflicting perspectives in order to obtain its own clarity, it might actually you know, narrow the perspectives and, and continuously show you in the dialogue um, confirmation of its hypothesis, confirmation of, its, of, of how it sees the, uh, of its points of point of view on the disturbance, confirmation, 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 right? but maybe manipulating also your emotions so um, so that you can get convinced and then you can tell everyone you're the only one right on this planet, which takes to that to us. So I think that I managed to explain this in a nutshell. I'm going to take it step by step now so that I don't get lost. So um, you've got your planning of the, of the five lessons, you know, you've got your table and you've got explanations of the learning outcomes related to the capabilities. Now, I didn't do that for this unit, for this planning unit, because it's your job and I, do, I don't want to solve all your problems. But you've done it in assignment one, so you should be actually, it should be easy for you now to implement those skills for assignment two. So what I was doing here, I, I specified the goal of literacy in those five lessons, which is exploring the concept of the message. Remember, I'm going continuously continuing with that concept from Kathy Mills because that wasn't covered by her and I think uh, 
many things weren't covered there, but I, I want to continue with it because it's a, almost like a story of our unit, right? We've done it, the critique of that paper in, from so many angles. I want to move on with the same story and I would like you now to draw parallels in the planning of, this, of these five lessons to your own context and see how you could adjust um, your own context to maybe the structure that I propose here. Obviously, you might actually make use from other strategies that I explain that I included here already in your lesson one. You don't have to follow it instantly. But my point here is to show you how to work with the reading for emotion model when planning five lessons. So we explore the con the concept of a, of a message or even educational message, right? educational message in ways that expand and develop students' social, personal, intercultural, cognitive and creative capabilities. Everybody knows where it comes from. And being, belonging, becoming, integrate those higher order skills as well. So, I will focus on this aspect today. I've discussed this in uh, previous weeks, so you can study it yourselves. So, there is nothing wrong with introductory questions, right? So, the principal comes in and says, children um, or students, dear students, uh, you've been here with us for a number of years, but this year we have new, new little children coming into our school. We would like to make them feel welcome. And wouldn't it be nice to create a product for them, something like um, they could watch or touch or, you know, um, hear? Um, that would communicate an educational message for them. So something welcoming, but also having some element of um, educational message, right? So that's a good activity because what it does, it, it, it doesn't create the context of a, of, of a lesson, of lessons or unit of work or for project, which is only for the teacher. But what it does, it's exactly, it's coming to you from the world. And now you have to use the literacy skills and learn which ones matter so that uh, you can actually affect the world, right? So the world comes to you, there's a, you assess of, of they came to you with a particular request. And now you have to explore what is out there in terms of um, literacy uh, opportunities. I don't know how to call it better. Um, so that you could utilize them to actually um, create this educational message. Now, one of the reasons why um, don't mind those, like this is interrogation, right? And this is when your three students uh, who are always, you know, I call them the dentist children. Obviously, they're not just the dentist children. There's some, you know, but you know what I mean. They have their arm in the air. They know every answer, right? And then you have this uh, child from somewhere sitting at the back and just looking at you with big, beautiful eyes and having no clue what you're talking about. So that's what I don't like. But we will level it up shortly. You can see that we will be doing a lot of work here. But this is like a little bit of a warming exercise, not not warming up in terms of, um, I don't know what, warming up in terms of people or children or students evaluating where they are, right? I do it all the time. I do it all the time. So someone says to me, oh, can you read this thing on... Um, how to think of the curriculum or something like that doesn't matter what question instead of reading it which is what you would expect I would do first I write on a piece of paper for myself what I think on that matter right and that allows me to establish my position and then when I read I will be able to change that position add to this position or say I am still on the peak of a job and nobody knows as much as I know. And this is a joke, obviously, but you know what I'm saying? You identify your position first and that gives you clarity from which you look at the world rather than just looking at the world and, and just being swayed left and right and not actually having a base to compare against. So it's very nice to have 
oh my god we have to do this message wouldn't it be nice and all the kids who have no choice they go yeah that would be really nice and they're wondering where is the misery gonna hit them and when <laughs> um Right, it would be lovely, it wouldn't be lovely. You can show some pictures of little children, you know, you remember when you used to look like that, you know, and all of that, you just sort of reduce the stress because it's stressful when someone says to you, you know, the right hemisphere is now ticking, going, oh my God, I have no idea how to do that, right? So, um, what is an, so what is the message? And we could also actually think, what's a message? What's a message? What's the difference between message and a word or a statement? Maybe there is none. When is the message, when is the statement a message, when is the statement a statement, maybe all, you know, and, and you can leave it open. You don't have to come up with the answer, right? So how do people communicate educational messages now? This is really getting like PhD level, you know, the kids, some kids will know, um, especially kids, I don't know, some kids may know, some kids may not know, but now we have uh, established in children's heads their own position from which they start to engage which is well, let's have a look how other people do it right so let's have a look how other people do it and now they really breathe better not not yet easier because they, they breathe easier not easy but easier because now the focus is away from them now we're gonna raid they still don't know um where the crisis is gonna happen but let's have a look and then you can show them this book now people say very often uh, oh we will ask them to guess what's in the book now obviously the book has has symbols which are uh, what cultural right so even the cover of the book has the focus disturbance dialogue it does and if it doesn't doesn't matter you have them in your head and you say to children oh my god what do we see here the most why do we see this thing why, why, why do you think this particular thing is screaming to us that's the focus right disturbance um uh, how could we work with children with the concept of disturbance now i'm you know old and i don't work with five-year-olds anymore so how, what's the concept of disturbance here in the picture on that thing ah uh, um, what do you think the story will be about? You know, that's the disturbance. And what do you think will happen? Which is a, you know, development and maybe dialogue, you know, what will be the heroes here? You know, why do we have a, a, a grasshopper here? You know, in the thing, and people say, well, you know, since I've been born, all my creatures in my little nursery stories, wherever grasshoppers or rabbits or a monkey, you know, the kind of, no, nobody asked them why, right? So you could actually have a little play here and maybe, you know, if they're smart, uh, not in a sense of smart, but in a sense of knowledge, you know, they may actually tell you some things here or you can ask them later on maybe, you know, do we know that particular animals stand for particular qualities? You know, so you could have a little discussion here. So, that, you know, don't, don't drag it, but it, even if you don't drag, it's going to take 20 minutes, so... Right, so we've done our warming exercise, but the purpose of it is, is for children or students to establish their own position to the task, which is the, 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 their understanding of their own level of, of uh, how they think of the concept of educational message, right? So now they are learning in relation to it, not in relation to an empty head. Okay. So as you can see, I've got here, I've divided the teaching here so let's look at the lesson one I've, I've given it two hours but you know i don't know anyway i've given it two hours you do however you wish so i've got master and focus here and i've got uh explore and play in here so that's stage whereby we discussed the concept of the fable so depending on the grade in which you actually use this so we, that, that sort of discussion is happening here. Why animals? What qualities are in animals? And you can have this discussion with children, you know. So if we use a fox, and the fox is always the smart one, stands for quality of smartness. And also, what's the other quality? When you are not just smart, but you also are a little bit manipulative. There's a word for it in English, right? So you will know that the, uh, um, 
folks will want to outsmart someone so that's why sometimes people say as smart as a fox or as manipulative as a fox now uh, you can come up with a concept of metaphor right so um, a particular animal in different cultures um, symbolizes those specific qualities you can have a discussion now with your children in class whether they can think of particular animals that they know of in their cultures or in their homes or wherever and with what kind of features they identify uh, those animals uh, and the concept of metaphor your smile is as beautiful as the rays of sunshine so you have a warmth right and you have a color you know your smile adds to my life the sort of implied things you can have a discussion on these things so the idea in this section is to increasingly connect children to the genre of the fable as the genre that is frequently used for morals right so you will not you don't have to say the word moral here all it is is about increasingly uh, bringing children closer to the idea that fables are about values and qualities right so um, that will come out in the wash so to speak as we actually go through the lesson but that's the literacy purpose that fables are a genre that is frequently used to communicate those uh, qualities now some of you uh, will teach uh, older children so what happens why why fables because most of the time the society was illiterate and they were oral stories uh, communicated orally it was easier to remember it's much harder to remember a novel than in its old glory than to remember six lines of the grasshopper and an end story these fables are ancient as i mentioned before they're probably twenty thousand years old not five not two and a half thousand but they go probably all the way to india and beyond right uh, so uh, people were always smart and they always had tools for life and that these stories have worked with us forever now what i would like to do in uh, the language aspect of the um, lesson is to focus on how language changes depending on the emotion we want to um, communicate um, so here's the motion of connecting child to the story so that you know that, so this is the focus right the focus stage connecting child to the story let's 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 have a look at the language it's used here it's so lovely there's a field you know so in in a field in a field in a field one summer's day right so we 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 what is needed right so here what is needed to be present in order to create that little landscape where the story is happening there's a field there's a summer day there is a hero of the story the grasshopper who's having a great time right look how many elements are in the text so again some of you who went through the three million uh, slides that i produced in this um uh, powerpoint text structure i think it's called uh, you will see that while some um, linguists were arguing that a student's text in naplan was great right it was produced it was wonderful they didn't understand why the examiner was unhappy with the text well the examiner was not happy because the text didn't have all these elements but the text will not have all these elements if you only teach as a fable through comprehension question who is in the story grasshopper oh that's wonderful tick next who came to the grasshopper and then tick so then the child will write on that plant test there was a grasshopper then an end came up then the ant was really tired and the grasshopper didn't care you know and in five words you can cover the whole fable but here you develop a child or a student's language and you don't develop it by forcing them to remember these words but now how do you know that this is such a ple pleasant scenery what is the scenery what's happening here what makes you think it's pleasant it's a field why is it a field well because grasshoppers are in field 
most of the time, right? And how do you relate to the field? It's lovely. It's green. It's it's, it's just a summer. It's it's pleasant. It's it's it's, it's uh, sunshine shining. You know, it's all of that sun is shining. All of this. It's just lovely. And the grasshopper is hopping and chirping, and it's just having a great time. So look how much of the scenery is painted here. It's a painting. With seven or eight words, this guy produced a painting. So you have to choose your words well to paint that little focus, right? And that's the language analysis, not the comprehension question, who is the main hero of a story? Right? Comprehension question bypasses all of that. So um, we had this little discussion about, um, so we don't have a discussion, but what, what do I have? Focus on that. So this is the objective, right? We will be analyzing the things. I'll take you through the analysis, obviously, as we go through focus. So language will be about exactly that, looking at the relationship between emotion and, and the linguistic structures or linguistic elements. And my point here is maybe a bit lengthy. Sorry for that. It's really hard to teach so much, so many elements in one podcast. Um, right. And I'm not really good at it. I wish I was. Um, I probably would not like listening to myself in this uh, podcast um, that I don't have to, you have to probably, or you should. So in any way, so by, ling by language element here, we will be looking, we'll be analyzing the language of, of the text and how it, com uh, how it communicates the emotions, right? How much is in it? Uh, which words? Are they accidental? What would happen if we change the word and all of that? So we're looking at how the language is used. Um, what else here? Right, so, the, so we will be using our discussions. Why discussions are important here? They are focused discussions, by the way. The focused discussions for each um, movement in the text are extremely important because they tap into your right hemisphere where you have nothing or very little, right? And now by analyzing, you, by magic, create more elements in your right hemisphere so you gather information that's why i wrote somewhere here that reading for emotion is also through gathering i don't know somewhere i wrote it right so you gather information and reading for emotion depends on it so you analyze but you and evaluate but you also gather information so you gather information so that you can compare and contrast your hypothesis that's very good it's here so um, so that's the discussions to stimulate the right hemisphere, to make the ha hem hem right hemisphere to sort of generate more models from the discussions allowed to uh, trigger more information to be generated. And then children will organize and reorganize it still in the right hemisphere before uh, they come up with some master plans or some patterns that then they can actually put into their left hemisphere while they are asleep, which is what our brains do. So we're triggering, the discussions are fantastic, the compare, contrast, and so on. The literature, we will add one or two texts to compare, because you cannot see something is black until you saw white, right? Because otherwise, if you see black, all is black, and there's no black, because that's your reality, so there are no colors. It's just, you don't have a concept of colors. So um, let's have a look. So we do the analysis of language, right, here. And that's what we're doing in order to get a better understanding of the um, genre of the fable. We're moving towards the moral, but we want to do exploratory, a little bit of activity that helps us to understand the fable and also understand it deeply through our discussions of how language is used in order to communicate the story and as a result the moral so the focus is in a we've discussed this so you can talk to children we, we can ask them draw you know prop i mean dig into their experiences do all stories begin so happily so cheerful can they think of some that are different now uh, what words can they think of different words once upon a time is this a happy beginning neutral right it's about it's kind of like more like um uh, what's the word for it? A mysterious, right? Once upon a time, we don't know when. It was a long time ago. And long time ago, it's mysterious. And you can actually teach them those words. 
So it, it's more like a mystery. Any other uh, stories they can think of and how they started? Was it again that sort of chirpy and hoppy, or did they have different words? Like a little bit of exploration. Um, now you can actually come up with some examples of other texts. Now in this particular lesson one, I don't go beyond the focus because later on, if I want to create another five lessons, what I would like children to actually see is what emotions come with which, with which genre. That would be really nice to do, you know, such a lesson. So say that in science uh, reports, when you're all the children write science, so maybe science reports are about credibility, clarity. So these are the emotions, gen, gen, uh, maybe connecting with our lives, connecting with our daily problems, um, um, clar you know, developing in a sense of clarity, developing all in a sense of confidence in the author because they uh, established the, uh, credibility, things like that. In your module four, you have a list of emotions. Um, there's about like, 600 emotions there. It's very good, develops your students' emotional vocabulary. That's great because they can actually assess themselves and others in those terms gradually better, increasingly better. So, um, so I put here a link to, so I, look, this is for all the students. I, I'm stupid, I couldn't find resources for this class good enough, but I found some sort of poems here. They're a little bit sad, so you can use them for older children, but for other children, you can also, um, for, like, for younger children, you can, uh, you probably will be able to identify some other resources and just, um, read it to them and analyze or even use if you want to um, ask children to copy and paste from the whiteboard place it into a, um, a text-to-speech system and the text-to-speech will actually read it out for them and that's nice that would be nice too whereby so the text would be pre-prepared would be on your computer you would put it on the whiteboard rather than having a book in your hand it will be on your whiteboard and kids will learn to copy and paste which is control the mouse little children control the mouse click control and c that's learning uh, um, letters and then learning software which is ict copy and paste click on play they will learn quickly quickly that play means play and or say i think it says say and the thing will say it and so on so they will be you'll be able to analyze and if you want to find out with children how to analyze the text from this particular new uh, story that you have integrated, then maybe by clicking on each of those uh, words, the, the avatar would read them out. So you could actually make it quite long, and but that's okay. It's a playful, it's a playful aspect, exploratory, and help, uh, help uh, playful learning, and that's very good. It can drag. There's nobody chasing you. It's fine children are learning a lot of skills this way. So um, I, I provided two, I expanded this fable uh, and, in, um, and had two more, I had two resources or one resource you can add for children to compare whether each story has always such, such a happy chirping uh, beginning, right? And whether the same emotion is being uh, translated. But if it isn't, do they still use so many words to actually give us a little bit of a painting of where we are? And that's the focus, right? Where are we in the story? You know, there was a father with two children, with two women, widower, with two girls, right? So look at this. Once upon a time, a widower, you know, was living with two or three um, uh, uh, daughters and blah, 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 blah. We learn a lot uh, just from the, the beginning. And making students aware of it when they, you know, on, on Naplan will write their own stories, they will know that they have to actually paint the story, not just say, the widow had three children, right? So once upon a time, because when? Mystery, mystery, put it in time, right? Put it in time, introduce the heroes, introduce their emotions, you know, things like that. Now we have this element of change, right? The end. So you can read for yourselves uh, what I wrote here, right? So this is an, another discussion enabling children to identify identify the words that created the contrast. Not just that the end passed by, 
it could have been still in the focus, right? Because it was this chirpy place where an ant came by and then chirp to and hop to and it's all still focus, right? But there's a mood change, right? The ant didn't just pass by, it was, you know, dragging stuff with her. So we have this thing, this is the contrast. So much happiness and so little happiness on this side. Or this um, maybe happiness too, but of a different kind. So has grasshopper contrasting with this ant? You know, what words? What words were with that? So you go back. What words did we have with grasshopper? Hopping and chirping. And here, what do we have? Oh, we have the uh, dragging the thing with her, right? So you, so the children now really, once again, focus on the words and focus on the emotion and focus also on the function in the text. It's a contrast. Happy, and this is now a working end. The dialogue, right? They're clarifying their positions. Have a look at the words they're using, you know. Why bother? You know, again, this happy. Why bother? Why bother? It's the attitude. What was he, you know, he's trying to... Um, so why bother is the, is the uh, attitude of the grasshopper. And an end is toiling and moiling, right? Now, your students may come up with different emotions in which they analyze this dialogue, how it makes them feel. Not what the author wanted to do necessarily, but how this makes them feel. And they will say, they worried about the end, right? Or, I don't know, you let them say whatever they want, you can actually ask them you should ask them why they think it which word it is and um why do they think so that this word does that so that's a kind of exploratory we want to generate the dialogue in those um structures in the right hemisphere that are now just literally breeding breeding in their heads like crazy right so we're after the exploratory dialogue not the right answer the right answer will pop out once we've done the whole five lessons, or at least even maybe this whole one lesson, right? The answer will come in, but it doesn't have to actually be here. But exploratory dialogue, the more intense it is, the more it looks at the relationship between the words and what it co the word communicates and why it communicates and where they have seen it before, in what context, right? This is very useful. So what happened now? So what happened? And on an end went on its way, yeah. But but it's that sort of opposition. He said what he said, but and then did its own thing, right? So the but is very important. So um, what we had in the in the story, we had here a dialogue. Why don't you do just what I do? No, I'm doing good things. Why bother? Right? And he's and the development, we have a change in the mood. Now, that's why it's, I call it development, because there's a change of the emotion. And we have all change, the movement in the story and also will be a change in the emotion that the author wants to elicit in you. And he says, but the end went on its way and continued its toil. How do you feel? Uh, I uh, This makes me think like the end is not doing what the grasshopper is doing. So why do you think so? What? It's, it's what? It's contradicting the grasshopper, right? So, are you concerned? Are you happy for the end? Yeah, we're happy for... I don't have all the vocabulary, emotional vocabulary. Happy? Are you supporting the end? I don't know. Well, we will see, right? But we can see the contrast here. So, even though grasshopper was saying whatever he's saying, but the end went its way, on its way and did her own thing. So we move towards resolution. And how do we know that it's a resolution? Because the first element in the paragraph, which is the most important and which creates an answer to our disturbances, right? Why was the end dragging the big uh, corn? Because the end knew that the winter was coming, right? So resolution we have when the winter came, um, things happened. So what emotion is here? Clarification, right? Clarification that life has seasons and we need to prepare for seasons. How do we prepare for seasons? 
well maybe not in Darwin but in other places you can even you know if you want to if you want to you know have these things ready you can on Google find children that when they prepare for season they have to prepare for season because in summer they run in, in dresses but in winter they have to have these big boots with fur and all kinds of things right because it's cold so you always have to prepare preparation is part of our life we need to foresee things and we need to prepare so what emotion it has clarified things to us right oh my god when the winter came when the winter came right so why these words why these words because if we didn't have that why that context that the winter came and the winter is opposed to the sunny day in the focus right when the winter came uh things unraveled so great so we can have a little chat about it the kids will by now would be very talkative and then the moral of the story then the grasshopper knew it is best to prepare for the days of necessity how do you feel uh how the how, what emotion i mean you don't ask children what emotion is this making you feel because but we could ask a better question what did the grasshopper learn right are you happy for the grasshopper did the story have a positive ending what did we learn right you can see that all these questions are not so much they are a little bit about the content but they are also about um they about generating discussion how do we know that those grasshopper learned a lesson oh because he said what did the grasshopper say it is best to prepare for the days of necessity it is best to prepare for the days of necessity so now we feel a bit more clarity not only that we feel more knowledgeable right it's a kind of like illumination revelation look at this what i'm doing now revelation look at these words you can use them with five-year-olds too it doesn't matter if they forget all of them that's the idea right they have to hear them and the more we analyze and work with children this way the more these words become part of their vocabulary we want them to be becoming right which is more than they are which means learning a little bit of more abstract terms which is the same as the cognitive skills of um, high or the thinking skills of uh, critical thinking and um, creativity we want children to actually have some learn some words some abstract words relating to the processes of uh, thinking so they feel feel more clarity they, they, are, they feel more knowledgeable so how is the message here of the fable worded now backward because this is all about language here today well it's worded it is best to do one thing it is best it is best to it is best to kick and now we're moving to the master and focus right we could use this structure of it is best to and actually generate our own messages or maybe educational messages right so um you know you could ask children in, as they sit together next to each other with their uh, neighbor uh, in the in, uh, at the bench um come up with some sentences they can um they may not be able to write the five-year-olds but they may be actually uh think out um and maybe with the speech to text and text to speech we could actually write it down that the transition and the primary children especially the primary children they will be able to actually write it down um it is best to what clean your room before it gets too messy it is best to show your love for your parents every day so they don't feel sad or oh, right so it is best they will come up with i mean five-year-olds are still the research says when they find well at, when they five they start losing their creativity because we in school uh, limited them but they're still pretty good at the age of five they will be still pretty good at the age 11 by the age of 25 they will be like me they will come up with two examples only so we've, i just lost my creativity 
typical example of education. But yeah, they will come up with examples and you can adjust this um, uh, master and focus uh, session and, and maybe use speech to text and text to speech um, uh, resources or tools or applications to um, get these um, morals that they will come up with with that structure to actually get them written right and so collaboratively with the, with the applications they write it down they know this is what's the computer written and that's fantastic it's written and we can put it up somewhere and have them it's like a one slide in the beautiful PowerPoint we could have with all these it is best to right listed it's fantastic we have a product without actually even fa finishing five lessons right so put it in the PowerPoint and you have a whole slide or two with those sentences it is best to right and now they have learned some structure of the moral obviously not every moral is like this but it's better to have this structure when you are learning first time the concept of the educational message but no structure right so we've done quite a lot of work within the first what I call lesson it will take several you know I don't know and two hours or maybe more a little bit maybe you have to split it a little bit right so I'm happy with you to do that so let's move to lesson two so I um what's the difference now here the difference in lesson two are uh, we have expanded the um, literature elements right now we have included songs that have morals and we've included thank you cards right it's really important it's not like we're going to generate message and we'll create an educational message using a particular application it's like it's not teaching literacy literacy you teach when you actually show in what different ways the same thing can be done and what different um literacy tools whether it's a thank you card a song or a fable where are they appropriate right so now we are contrasting a fable which is for everyone to read with a song and maybe also with a thank you card they all have educational messages but now used in different contexts and maybe um uh, not necessarily for different purpose but in different contexts because each context has its own requirements so we would summarize it right a little bit with children um so yesterday we read a fable we read the fable and how did it start ah it was very educational it was wasn't it but do we remember how the fable started now we're probing for this sort of emotional uh, analysis right we want children to remember happy then the contrast right then the clarification between two parties then life happened and then educational message popped out right so so how did it start it, ha it started happily chirpy all of that you know so they would say oh that started really good the grasshopper was really happy how do you know it was happy right you want those words to come out from them it was it was happy really and what else and it was you know you just drag it out of them so happy and then what happened then an end passed by and it was, uh, it was, um, yeah, there was an end there. It was, it, it wasn't good, was it? No. <laughs> How did you feel for an end? Sorry. You felt sorry for the end. Yes, we all felt sorry for the end. And then did the grasshopper feel sorry for the end? Yes, he did. And then he was saying that the, that the end was toiling and moiling. You want those words out of them, right? So you, and then, and then what happened? But the end did its own thing right but the end so you want that sort of contrast with that word but and what happened and we learned that the grasshopper was wrong how did we learn it uh, because the grasshopper did, was hungry and how did they you know you get them to the point when they remember it is best it is best to do this it is best to do this um, before something happens it is best to do this before something happens so we've got the lovely summary now 
now you could just focus on the moral you know just no longer a story but let's have a look at the lit at the uh, thank you cards and at songs that consists of morals only now obviously um I have my own favorite, so I used Dimash Kudai Bergen and I gave you the link to his song. So you could use him with children, you know, say 11, 12, 13. But the younger children, you have to actually look for your own favorite songs with morals. So when you play, you could ask children when they're older or with little children to remember, right? Or maybe, or maybe stop the song after about a few seconds and play it maybe first and ask them to think what morals or what educational messages were in the song and they will throw some uh, out and then I mean throw you know they'll, they'll suggest some and then you might actually start listing them look at this it's adding to our PowerPoint right we could get all these all these sentences here and put them back into our PowerPoint where is our PowerPoint in lesson one here we just add more here right I'm not gonna write them because it's gonna make this plan messy and someone will not understand what's what that means later on but yeah we could add them that's so we're actually collecting a pile we could actually have a book of educational messages right before we actually create an app or before we have a play or before we have our whatever first we might actually start with creating a list Look at this. We never thought that we could do that, right? So we get the um, Dimash, and Dimash, for, uh, I, I use Dimash, you can use some other song that you can think of, but it has some beautiful messages. We are one, united we are strong, together we are strong, we are one big family, together we will rise and we will shine, right? Together, it's about, it's about this togetherness, it's about that we're one organism, right? They're lovely. And have a look at... Um, cards did i have a card somewhere written i could swear i wrote a card you know so we, we could actually collect some cards either from the shop or from the internet and there will be some values they written like um, i'm sure i've written it i just can't say it now you can see it because you know as nervous as i am when i actually teach but basically you know something um without your love i wouldn't be who i am right so that's for the mother or for the father without your support for some reason love goes to the mother support goes for the father don't 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 get me into this discussion why but anyway so you could come up with some cards which have these you know are they morals nonetheless i'm not quite sure whether they're educational messages but they are messages and they are they are just some ways of um, sharing your own um, your own level of learning with people to whom you owe right we all owe things to someone so uh it's, it's appreciation is about owing maybe you can actually contrast but maybe in the song it is more like still a moral but the other one is more like appreciation, right? So you could actually contrast that nothing hurts. Right, so the mastery. Literacy. Yes, we, would, we might actually now learn that morals are about communicating values, right? Um, about what values? Well, you could actually identify those values. You know, united, we, uh, we're strong. What value is it? We're, we're just one org organism, right? Uh, what else? Um, before, um, what was that statement there about the end? Uh, it is best to, right? Preparedness. So um, what value? Preparedness. To prepare matters, right? So uh, we are one family. Uh, preparedness matters. I don't know what other um, morals will come up from... Um, our explorations and from our resources we use but we can actually now look at those things as values and here's your value education you cover which is the personal and social learning honestly uh, it's we're going well and we haven't even started it's only lesson two right and the literature um, when and why do we create these proverbs and when you know and, and, and when do we communicate them you know when uh, what when and how do we communicate them right uh, so uh, when so when
when you, you can ask the children, it, it is your synthesizing here, you're synthesizing the learning, synthesizing the learning. So when do we communicate them? When we want to um, tell people a, a story that has affected us, right? When we want to uh, build up people, right? Tell a story that has affected us, build up people, educate people, right? Well, you can't always play. Right, it's a very hard story to tell people, but um, they can test it on themselves and play and see where they get. So educate people, and maybe the cards and gratitude is a little bit different, but to show uh, that we're aware that we owe people, right? So it's not so much educational message, more like um, a, an appreciation message, and it's slightly different. It's still a message, but slightly different. So we move to lesson three, and it's very short here. Because I would like you to now pick up a, a different a story from a different culture. Remember that literacy has also the intercultural element. And now we want to actually be more increasingly inclusive in our class. So uh, the ant and the grasshopper was kind of like, uh, what do you call it? Not, uh, it's, it was transnational, right? It was beyond the national boundary. It's a heritage of humanity. Um, and that's why I said it's way older than because the Greeks claim it, the Indians claim it, I can tell you that, the Indian culture is extremely old, and then the Indians claim their culture is even older than any scientist claims, so I will go with it, because we know very little. It'd be nice to know how to spell analyze. Right, so I have a look maybe first with an Aboriginal story, pick an Aboriginal story, and go through the same analysis as in lesson one, and see how the text of that story and the animals that they have in that story, which um, qualities they represent, represent which way they uh, um, speak, which way they uh, communicate and what emotions they communicate. So do this analysis and maybe um, communicate again or identify what's at the end in order to master, to, in that, for that phase of mastering, once you finish the exploratory phase, go to the master phase and say what structure of the moral they have that you could actually uh, uh, include into your structure of educational messages, right? So, or of uh, morals. Um, some of them may not have a moral, some because it's implied. Uh, so maybe children will word it themselves and then we can include it here or uh, they will have a structure and you simply include here. And that will go to our PowerPoint with all the lists of um, educational messages we are collating in this PowerPoint here. Look at this, we're going to have hundreds, hundreds, not just one. So we go to lesson four, and I strongly uh, suggest that you do the same analysis. Now it's going to go faster and easier and kids will be, do you see how you are just kind of like, almost like drilling them into this analysis? So, um, that we have done in lesson one and we could go actually through it a little bit faster because they already got the idea. And have a look at, ha at, the, at the Chinese or Vietnamese stories a lot of Vietnamese stories, draw on Chinese stories, but you yeah, have a look, pick something more Asian so that you can actually comply with the Asian um, cross-curriculum priorities. And uh, so pick a story, an Asian story, a Chinese story. I've read a lot of very nice Asian stories uh, with, you know, with, with the moral. So it would be nice. You probably are like, you are likely to have an Asian uh, child in the class, so that will make them feel um, great. And, um, and maybe an expert also, you might actually draw on his or her knowledge uh, about some qualities of animals, you know, so things will emerge. So you do an anal analysis here too. You will identify, the, remember, in the master and focus, what values are represented in that um, story, in the proverb, so uh, in the educational message and, and through the fable and also through the moral. Now it's very interesting whether that value actually also exists in our culture, whether we 
you know so but it's good to expand uh, our own knowledge of the values that are in our uh, broader regional community and learn about them so that's a lesson four lesson five i changed a little bit uh, from the plan i had in week eight or week seven so what i would like in this lesson five is to consolidate what we have learned right so um i talk about here about synthesizing things uh, which is like summarizing um so what here i would like students to do is to create a poster summarizing what they have so far about morals so we already have one product which is the um powerpoint in which we have all summary of all the educational messages or morals that we have found through our explorations um then um then what I would like them to do is a poster where they actually um, reflect, where they demonstrate the stages of the story that they want to communicate, not necessarily yet for the little buddies that will come maybe later, but this will be a basis for it so we've got these educational so look at this what resources we've done so the principal asked for an educational message and something you know to actually give it to children so first we've collected we had the powerpoint with all these educational messages where we collected everything that came up from our lessons and discussions um and now what students do they pick a story that talk to them and they represent it graphically and they put words to it right because we want them to learn to actually relate words to the different stages of the story so let's assume they do their grasshopper story some of them will do a chinese story some of them will do a story that their mother told them i don't know it's free some of them will do a story they create in their own heads i don't know we don't really care we want particular things to be present in the structure so what do we have as a structure so they can paint imagine them drawing a happy grasshopper they don't have to draw it So we had an ant toiling, right? So an ant came by. So um, we have, the, you can find the ant toiling. I wonder whether, no, I can't help myself. Um, let's have a look. Oh my God, we've got the ants everywhere. Oh, look at that, there's an ant. Right, so they can uh, either, uh, redraw it from those pictures or draw it from imagination or just copy and paste and have these texts written so we have a poster now with an entire story we have a graphic and we have uh, those words right we actually recreate the book in a sense but with our own hands in order to actually um um address uh, what's the word reinforce those structures and the sequence of the story and uh, and the emotions that all of this was generating in us and especially the words that did that happy then this drama is happening right the confusion why is the end toiling and then the dialogue which is confusing everybody why is that right so the, the dialogue was kind of confusing children the emotion was confusing why couldn't the end have a good day just like the grasshopper did and then we have another structure right so so things so the children are learning the shifts in the text that were happening right and the fable is just great for it because it's so simple so then happened but so development right so the so end is going it's why so that you can you can just show how the end is just minding its own business and then we can draw the winter right so what, what will ha happen in the winter poster uh, in the in the poster which has a next picture which is the winter so what will happen in the winter we have when the winter came oh we have to have a picture of the winter then we have to have the grasshopper in it then we have to have no food in it he's just dying of hunger oh my god that would be a one miserable drawing right and then the moral 
and then we will draw the moral. So when the winter came, this, these words will be on the poster. So it's a whole poster with a whole story. And, you know, even if we stopped here with the educational message for children, that would be lovely because if children in your class analyze different texts, say maybe a Chinese text, Another person will do the grasshopper story, another person will do an Aboriginal story, another person will do their own story. It'd be nice to have presentations to children with those pictures, with your children actually telling a story to the new buddies. Do you know what happened? One day, you know, when there was a great weather and it was a summer and there was a grasshopper and the little five-year-olds or four-year-olds who come to school, they'll have their mouths open and they'll be listening to the older peer, you know, pointing to pictures and telling them what happened. And then they will have the next one and the next one and so on. It's a nice sort of afternoon uh, with scones and whatever else children eat with all the peers making beautiful presentations of stories with posters that they created themselves. They could also take the little PowerPoint that they created with all the proverbs and give it to the parents of little buddies. You know, make a little book from that poster and give it to the parents. Uh, so that the parents actually get, what, reassured that the school is doing amazing things and teaching values and, and, and children are learning to create a, a, a very interesting um, set of um, uh, resources like the like the book you know with all these nice proverbs maybe next to the proverbs we can actually put some um, little graphic to make it more interesting and so on and this is the five lessons now in the master and focus f stage here you want to what you want to do is to facilitate these writings to actually happen and children to remember um, which text to um, include to signal a shift, right? So um, little children may ask you to use, uh, you know, help for help with writing. So you help them, and as they actually are help with this text to speech and speech to text resources, um, you no longer drilling them with the phonics. In this particular uh, stage of the, of your lesson plan, what you do is um, you uh, they are focused because they only have to write what they already have done so many times. They have uh, covered this in lessons and now they're just reinforcing how to write it. Um, with all the children, you create a post and then the, um, right, with all this, with all the children, maybe less, less sort of a heavy work is required on helping them to actually get these words right. And now, and more like, um, making sure that they get the right words not how to write it but that they get the right words in the right places now i can feel and hear that five-year-old the teachers of five-year-olds will say this is too complicated to write for little children that's only because we have um, a culture in schools where we think that you have to start with simple and then one day they will be able to write What's this most complicated and the longest word that in English? Remember how people from um, uh, what was the name of this nun that had an umbrella flying nun? You know the flying flying uh, uh, babysitter. I forgot her name. Anyway, at this very moment, when I teach, just uh, my head is empty. So um, yeah, it's not necessarily the case because functionality of the purpose drives everything and the success that they can do it with the help of the computer, you know, they just tell it to the talk typer to, to, to type it for them and they can copy and paste it or they can uh, just mimic the way it's written, right? It, with their own little hands and do it as well or as badly as they can and that's good enough. No problem, nothing will happen. So. I wouldn't be too worried about it. Um, yeah, so that's five lessons. Now, formative assessment, you can read here for yourselves what I wrote here. Um, and then what do I uh have? From the PowerPoint that I have, and it's very funny, I can't move this. There is another 
another page here. But what I did here underneath, I posted some links to stuff that, you know, I, I'm not requiring you to check those links for assignment two, but if you don't mind, if you one day, you know, you just have those links and one day maybe you can use them, one day you may not want to use them, maybe it's not interesting. So I just included them because I found them and I thought, you know, I like resources and maybe one day they could come handy. Right, so that's the end for the day and hopefully that was a little bit useful and brought that reading for emotion, made it a little bit uh, more familiar.